Shalom, shalom, Sister Staya. Shalom, <laughs> Sister Abia. So nice to see you. It's and nice to, to finally be put a picture <laughs> with, right? <laughs> and it's so good to put a picture with the messages, you know? So uh, we praise always you. love seeing you guys' faces. <laughs> praise ya, praise ya. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to actually hear, well, to speak to you today and to hear your testimony. Um, I kind of, you know, I read a little bit of what you want to talk about and it's been a while since we did a testimony. So to be honest with you, when I read your tes testimony, I was like, let me see, you know, because like I said, it's been a while. So I was like, let me see what, what is it you want to share? And when I read it, I was like, okay, we have to do this testimony. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm like, okay, this one here. Yes. I'm going to make sure we do this testimony. So um, I definitely want you to just share today. I'm going to just let you, I'm allow you to say, you know, whatever it is you want to say. Um, we can actually start um, all the way back from your upbringing and okay. then, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with sharing or however you want to share, just go okay. ahead on and, and let's go. <laughs> well, my upbringing mm -hmm. is, um, I have one sister, and although my mother and my father were married, they were separated. So I had never lived in a household with my father. Mm -hmm. And he unfortunately passed when oh. I was six years old. Oh, wow. And he so passed from an overdose. You know, wow. Found out that he passed from an overdose um, using boy and girl, which is cocaine and heroin. Mm. And I used to always wonder why my mother would say to me, and I, I kind of go back and forth, you know, with some things. She used to always <laughs> yell at me when I was a child, like a teenager, 12, 13, you just like your father. Mm. Uh, you will end up just like your father. Mm. Because I started using marijuana at an early age, smoking okay. cigarettes, which was the gateway to the drug addiction, you know. Mm. Um, wow. So, you know, mm. and I was the disobedient child out of the two, me and my sister. Okay. She was the goody two shoes, and I was mm. the disobedient one. Even though she really wasn't that good at goody two shoes, she was just better at hiding stuff. I was mm. just that out. I was just <laughs> here it is. Here right. I'm gonna get it you didn't hide anyway, anything. So I might as well just be wild and loose, you know. So, right. And, and my mom, you know, she raised us as a single mother. She raised us to the best of her ability. You know, we mm -hmm. didn't want for anything. It wasn't, you know, like we were poor or even though she said we were poor, but I didn't see how we were poor. We were going out to dinner every other weekend. You know, mm -hmm. if, if it was certain things that we wanted under that pagan holiday, we got everything that was on our list. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we were, we were. We were privileged mm. and we were spoiled, mm. you know, truth right. be told, I, I was spoiled. If I said mommy this, mommy that, mommy that, mm. you know, um, I had both sets of grandparents, my father and my mother for many years of my life, you know, and mm -hmm. I saw some things that uh, in the household that really affected my life later on. You know, okay. Um, he, and, and a lot of it was, uh, I can say it now, it was the feminist attitude. Mm. Wow. Because unfortunately, there was a generational curse with losing husbands at an early age. Mm -hmm. My wow. grandmother, my mother's mother, her husband was murdered when my mother was four. Um, my dad died when I was six. And you'll find out later on, my husband died when I was 29. So that was a curse. But, you know, as the most high began to deal with me and I began to allow him to deal with me because I was a stubborn one. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a spirit of being implacable. Mm -hmm. I was heartless. I was cold. You know, I was one of the ones. Uh, it was a song like in the 30s. My grandmother told me about about heart hearted Hannah. She would pour water on a man, on a drowning man. 
And I had that kind of spirit. Really? I, didn't, I had no love for nobody, not even myself. You know, I acted like I liked you or I acted like I love you. But when when the cover came off, <laughs> it was many nights. My pillow was soaking wet, crying out. You know, not and it wasn't even in the truth yet. I would cry out to the pagan name that you know we all knew mm -hmm. God, the title, right. not even mm -hmm. a name, a title, God. You know, right, and that, right. And that other one, <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I, crying. Out, but why? You know why? Where's the love? Why don't anybody like me? Why don't anybody love me? Cause I was a mean piece of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was cold mm -hmm. and. And I wore it as a badge some days to keep people away from me because I really oh, didn't want, I really didn't want anybody seeing me. You know, I really didn't want anybody really getting close to me to see mm -hmm. how ugly in oh. the inside I really was. So, wow. you know, I grew up with that in the household. I grew up watching my grandmother abuse my grandfather. Mm -hmm. You know, some people say, you know, the dad was the one to abuse No, it was my grandmother. I remember mm -hmm. being a little girl and and hearing my grandmother throw my grandfather down the steps and breaking his arm. Ooh. You know, uh, and she used some choice words to describe you. Even as a little girl, I got called um, a pig effort mm. more than I got called my name or the wow. B word. Or, and that was from not just from my grandmother, but from my mother also. You know, there were wow. times that I didn't even think that they would call me by, you know, my birth name. And I, I would just sit there and, unless they called me by the other name. And I'd be like, yes, because I got called it so much, mm -hmm. you know, and and that did that did a lot uh, about how the how lowly I thought of myself. You know, even when I growing up as a teenager, I'd be like that referred to myself as that female dog in heat because that's what I heard mm -hmm. all the time, you know? So right. that was, you know, that was my childhood, teenage year. Ooh, I knew mm -hmm. that was going to happen. Teenage <laughs> year, I grew, <laughs> I grew up watching my, my mother smoke weed, drink alcohol. It was, you know, it was no, nothing to see a white boy laying around the house. So when, uh, she would go out with her friends and we would go over her friend's house. Their older children would watch us. And I remember, I think I might have been about nine, eight or nine, between eight and nine. Um, we were over a friend's house and they were in the basement partying. And the older daughter, I think she was about, she might have been about 16 who was watching us. And she's like, go downstairs and grab some of them Miller Nips and bring it upstairs to me. And I said, why do I feel like you got me doing something wrong? I said, okay, I'm gonna grab you some Miller Nips. But I stayed down there a little bit too long because she came to the steps to see what I was doing. I was drinking two of those Miller Nips. So mm -hmm. I had a taste of alcohol very early in my life. But from that point, you know, that one, that one occasion, it kind of set up for some things that would transpire in my life later on. You know, at mm -hmm. the age of 13 is when I started smoking cigarettes. No, that's not true. I got caught by my father's father smoking a cigarette when I was about maybe 11. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, you smoking? I'm like, oh, no, Pop Pop. I was not smoking in the bathroom. Smoke mm -hmm. wafting out the door. You can smell it all. It didn't even wasn't smart enough to spray perfume, air freshener, mm -hmm. open up the window, blow it. Wasn't that smart at eleven? Right. Like, oh, you want to smoke? And he made me smoke a whole pack of cigarettes. I, that he was a he was a military man, so his his punishments were really harsh. Mm -hmm. Out of line, you know. But it it just showed me some things about him. You know, he he was harsh. He, a, a black man in the Korean War, you know, he got his own stories to tell. He's like, oh, you going to smoke? All right, you going to smoke this whole pack? I remember getting sick. Mm -hmm. But it didn't stop me. Because I, it, 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 if I would have thought about it in retrospect, I remember how nasty that cigarette was. Mm -hmm. Why would I pick it back up some years later? 
And I and I justified. I said, oh, that was he made me smoke Paul Malls. My grandmother smoked nine mentholated cigarettes. When I picked up a cigarette at 13, it was mentholated. It tasted totally different. Mm. You know, my mama mm -hmm. smoked Newports back in the day. So I stole her Newports. When I went to junior high, you know, back then they still you could still go to the store with a note saying it was a pack of cigarettes for your parents or elder and they would give it to you. Mm. You know, wow. so I started smoking faithfully every day at 13 and got bust out of my neighborhood, which was uh all basically all black people, all Hebrew people, that community, and I got bused mm -hmm. to a Caucasian school. Mm -hmm. So when I went to out of the neighborhood and started meeting people of other races, other nationalities, being involved in some other things, being introduced to other things, it, weed was just popular in my neighborhood. It was popular in my house. So mm -hmm. when I started going to school, I was introduced to uh, black beauties, speed pills, red devils, mm -hmm. yellow jackets, you know. And I always had an issue with as when I grew up, they called me the heavy one, the chunky one, because my sister might have been about that big. You know, we was like the 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 spoon, the plate and the knife. Remember that nursery rhyme, the plate being round. And that was me and her because I was she was visibly um, underweight for her age. And I was the extreme opposite. So I was always called the fat one, the chunky one. You know, even my, my favorite uncle before he passed when I was a little girl all my life, he called me Butterball. Mm -hmm. And that did something to me. I had a confidence about, even though I wasn't really overweight, but being compared to somebody who was really, really thin made me have a complex that I was fat. So when I went to that Caucasian school and they were taking speed bills, I'm like, I'm it. You know, that mm -hmm. that's that's it. I'm this is a way for me to fit in with some other people. Well, I did it to the extreme. Wow. You know, I became addicted to that speed, which opened up a door later on to snorting cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, snorting monster, which is, you know, they call it ice some places. We called it monster, but other places called it crank. It was methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. You know, and I began to snort and I began you know, to just venture out and try some other drugs. Smoked angel dust, didn't like that. You know, had a bad mm. trip. I was like, I'll never do that again. Mm. <laughs> you know, but it just, it just, it just, it just grew and progressed. You know, there were periods where I would stop, but I wouldn't stay stopped. You know, I might have stopped six months, but that seven month, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna celebrate. I'm gonna light up a split. You know, mm -hmm. uh, just just really weird uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. But even during those times, some other things had begun to transpire. I remember at 14, um, my mother used to read erotica. I got one of them books and I read that book and that book opened the door for perversion to enter in. Because when I when my hymen was broken, it wasn't by anybody. I did it myself because of what I read in that book. Uh, wow. Not understanding what spirits had entered in by reading that book. My mother mm -hmm. used to always tell me, stay out of her room. Don't go in her room. Don't touch her stuff. I was disobedient in more ways than one. And I wanted to know what she was reading. What was so interesting about that book? When I, unfortunately, I found out. So did that. I uh, had sex with the first guy when I was 15. Um, and it just progressed into something of wanting to be loved. Always missing my father. Because, again, he died when I was six. I didn't have him in my life. I always was looking for a daddy not a father mm -hmm. but a mm -hmm. daddy right you know and 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 that just progressed up into when i got married when i buried my husband and we're going to talk about that because that's that's some other stuff okay. but what i began what i recognize now um 
only through the Most High, only through the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, some things, not just, um, just, just many spirits of perversion. There's the umbrella of perversion, but up under it, it comes some many different things. It's like an octopus. You know, you got the head, but then you got them them tentacles. You know, mm-hmm. so it branched out in many different ways in my life, and I was open for it. I didn't mm-hmm. grow up in a household that even went to church. I didn't, the first time I went to church is with my father's mother, my paternal grandmother. My mother's mother, she would watch uh, TV Vanages and TBN. Her favorite was Reverend Ike. And Peter Popoff, she watched them kind of charlatans. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you ain't hear no word, but give me some money and I'm going to send you a blessing. Or, you know, I'll send you some water. I'm going to send you the rag. I'm going to send you. Mm-hmm. you know, never know. Never heard no word in my mother's house under my grand, my mother's mother. Never. Never mm-hmm. saw my mother go to church until, you know, it was certain a funeral. That might have mm-hmm. been the only time we went, walked into a church under my mother. You know, but so my father's mother, he she took me to took took me to the Baptist church, and I heard Baptist born, Baptist bred, gonna be a Baptist till I'm dead. Mm-hmm. And it was a very renowned preacher, and not just in in Philadelphia where I grew up at, but you know he was renowned. You know, it was the Reverend Leon Sullivan. You know, mm-hmm. and um, I had I had no word there. Wow. Not not saying maybe he maybe he did preach. I don't know. I was a little girl. And the right. only thing I remember about going to church is when my grandmother would buy these candies for us. They were like little beads and you could shoot them through the straw. And my whole thing about going to church was trying to see who had I could ping with shooting that candy to the straw. I don't remember Sunday school. I remember um, the ushers would calm women down when they got happy. You know, that's mm. that's what they call having the Holy Spirit back then. They got happy. And they mm. were coming and fanning them with the fans and giving them water and exiting and escorting them out of the sanctuary. Wow. So I didn't even understand, you know, that they were quenching the spirit if that's what they actually had. Mm. I don't remember <laughs> word. I don't remember instructions. I don't remember anything other than Going in the sanctuary and shooting this candy through this straw, hitting people hats. Mm. Didn't hear what? a word at her. Never heard Bible. Never opened the Bible. Never saw my family do that. It would be Sunday morning. They would put on WDAS, which was Louise Williams, who was uh, a preacher. And all she did was play gospel to music near the cross, you know, mm. uh, uh, uh. I'm going up the rough side of the mountain. This is what I heard on right. you know, Sundays, you know, but there was no scripture. There was no talking to us about scripture. So I grew up really, really lost anyway. And, 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 it, and it stemmed into even in adulthood where, you know, we'll go to church, uh, thought I was saved, but had a form of godliness, yaliness, and denying the power thereof. I could shout. I could fake speaking in tongues until I really started speaking in wow. tongues. You know? mm. and, 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 and I was in the Pentecostal church and on the choir. And I remember this man who was this guy who was um, evidently it was evident he was feminine. Mm. He was like, girl, I'm going to teach you how to speak in tongues. I was like, teach me how to speak. He was like, yeah, Rob Kawasaki got my tea and toast. Slow down, that's what it says, but saying it fast made it give the appearance that you were mm. speaking in a tongue. I'm wow. telling you. So w- mm. went from Baptist and then went to uh not maybe when I was around 23. A drug problem had really got crazy. And I came back home to my mother and she looked at me. She said, I don't know what you're doing, but you better stop. Didn't go into rehab or anything. <laughs> the most I put the fear of y'all and me through my mother. Because all wow. she had to do was say, don't do it. Don't say it. Don't go. 
by that point, obedience started to kick in just a little bit more, you know, and I, I went down to like a size three because I was smoking so much cocaine. And when she said, stop, I kind of looked in the mirror and I saw something that made me afraid. So I stopped. I went to Narcotics Anonymous with a friend of mine who I had grew up with. We had been friends since we were five years old. By that time I was 23, we were, you know, she was like, come on with me, we are gonna go make this meeting. Well, the <laughs> meeting for me was not, I, I like to hear the people's stories about what they did when they was out in their addiction. It, it was interesting to me. I was like, oh, I ain't did that. Oh, I ain't all mm. that, no. Oh, no, <laughs> I just smoked cocaine, I didn't smoke crap, you know. Mm. It had, a, it had, a, it had haughtiness and arrogance. You know, oh about that. And and mm. I started making meetings not so much to stay clean, but I was looking at the men. Mm. Not understanding wow. that what perversion was working in me. I was looking at the men. I was looking at the women. I was like, who wow. going to get got in here today? Wow. Something kicked in because I stopped using the drugs. You know, it was... But I picked up another one, you know, Wow. Uh, sleep. I, I mean, I can't say that I was. Yeah, I was a 403. Yes, I was. <laughs> you know what a 403 is, right? <laughs> what is the 403? No, no, no. <laughs> at HOE? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Just flipped oh, it wow. upside down. Yeah, Flip, so, oh, okay, you, right, right, right. Oh my goodness. You know, I, I gave myself to whomever. Mm. And it wasn't even about people coming to me. I was aggressive and I ran after people. I chased you. Really? Yes. So I was all out of order. Wow. So that was both women and men? Yeah. And it was like, you know, I know I used to, I know when, when the most high first began to really seriously deal with me and I began to seriously let him deal with me. I was like, well, I was never in a relationship with a woman. So what you do? So it was more about fee in the perversion, the sex, the act, mm. Mm. you know, I was addicted to porn. I was addicted to pleasuring myself. Didn't need nobody mm. there. Matter of fact, mm. I didn't even want nobody there half the time because I got to the place where I wanted to be by myself, you mm. know. Wow. And I remember talking to, and I was in church then. I was in Christendom, churchianity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and was ordained as an evangelist. Was doing these things. Wow. Was not was not allowing the most high make me accountable. I will I, no, it's okay. It's I'm all right. I'm not messing with nobody else. Not understanding the scripture says when you reap to your flesh, you reap corruption. Mm -hmm. you know, I told you I had a form of yaliness and denying the power right. of love. I was like, I, and now I can understand now, you know, seeing preachers and pastors who go against what the word says because that was me. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I remember I, 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 the most high began to deal with me and I told a friend who was an elder about the problem I had with masturbating. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, girl, that's okay. God understands. Light bulb went on. Still wasn't in the truth yet. But the light bulb mm -hmm. went on. I said, what do you mean God understands? No, he don't. Mm. He began to deal with me while I was still in the church. Wow. I didn't know that it was God's voice that I was hearing. I kept saying it was God. Because mm -hmm. I knew God, you know. Right, right. And I said, no, this something wrong here. That's not acceptable. Well, you're not going, and she just began to talk. You well, you're not. It's not like you're fornicating. I said, well, oh, in my. essence, it is. And she said, well, what? How? You, why? Why do you say that? I said because I picture a man in my head when I'm doing it. 
is hmm. don't I said and don't the scripture say when you look upon somebody is lust? Mm -hmm. is, is that not something that's in Your our flesh? Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, 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 no. Called me by my name. I was like, I'm going to have to stop talking to this chick. Because mm -hmm. um, you an elder. You done got the big collar on. But something mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. You know, something, right. something not right. And this was somebody who I was really close to that I looked at being a friend, a sister in Christ. Somebody who um, supposedly was supposed to have more wisdom to me. Mm -hmm. you, got this, you got this elder title, you know. Right. I, I felt like the elder was higher than the evangelist. You know, I was all mixed up because I really, I really didn't understand the move of Yah. I didn't really understand the scripture. I only read scripture if I had to teach and preach. I didn't, mm. I didn't I didn't live my life according to the word of God. I didn't. Right. So, and when he began to impart some wisdom in me, like this is error. And he took me right to the scripture that says, when you reap to your flesh, you reap corruption. And I'm like, father, am I corrupt? Am I dirty? Am, is something, what? And I really began to seek the truth about this thing. Wow. And it took me back to that 14 year old reading that book and he began to open up and wow. open up, give, give me eyes of understanding and give me wisdom about that very thing that I did at 14, what I allowed to enter in and wow. fester and grow. And move wow. in this area of my life. And move in this area of my life. And I said, well, I think something's wrong with me. <laughs> mm. I thought I was mm. the worst person. Mm -hmm. The guilt of mm. even committing the act by myself. The guilt. And I used to hide up under the cover after I performed. Mm. Like y'all couldn't see me. <laughs> right. And I would cry. I'm like, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. So then I got a boyfriend. One of many. Mm. I said, well, you want me to do that to you? You have to do this. Mm. And it still ended up with me doing that very act because there was mm. no being satisfied. Wow. Wow. And then I would treat them mean. The implacable spirit would come up. The harshness, the coldness would come up. Mm. So did all that and made meetings and catering to the sex addiction and the clothes shopping and spending money and chasing everything but not opening up scripture and even though and i'm gonna tell you something i would i, I would make meetings and and you know people would speak and i had opportunity to speak about you know my addiction and all that and i always referenced it to that false name mm -hmm. i would talk i talked a good game wow and and that's how come i know that when he began to really really I began to really, really hear him call me. He was like, I need to, I need to set you free from this, this form and fashion that you have, that you are set apart. And, and, and back then it was holy. Mm. Wow. Because I was a whited sepulcher full of dead man's bones. Mm. Wow. And I always looked at myself as being so prim and proper and and it was just arrogance and haughtiness, you know, two of those six things that the most high hates. But I didn't read that scripture. You know, I didn't want to read that scripture. Right. So made me is and was this man who seemed to be very interested in me. And we mm -hmm. dated and we fell a couple of times. And this man ended up being my husband. Mm -hmm. Sis. And yeah. Before you go further, 
because it keeps coming to my mind. That book that you said you read, what was it? What did it consist of at 14? Bestiality. Okay, okay. You see, I, I, it was a woman okay. whose German shepherd she trained to do some things. Wow. Wow. And that's how come I know it was the host of perversion mm. that entered in. Wow. Okay. You, I didn't think about it back then, but I, as time progressed, I thought about getting me a German shepherd and teaching them really? some things. Yes. Truth be told, wow. yes. So the okay. host of perversion through that book entered in. And as I grew and became more mature, so I thought it branched out into different areas. Uh, I got you. Okay. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. So then so we meet the husband, the attendant. And, you know, we had fell maybe like three times before he had even started talking about marriage. And I was mm -hmm. like, well... I was looking at this other guy. I was kind of messing with this other guy while we were dating. We weren't mm -hmm. engaged yet. He wasn't talking about marriage. The very, very first time he started talking about, I'm going to marry you, I left all the side pieces alone. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let's see what happens. Long story short, we got engaged. And he said, while we're doing this, we're not we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not sleeping together. We're not sleeping together. We're not doing anything until after we're married. I was like, okay, that's not a problem. I, I think I could do that. You know, we went to go find a church home. And he took, he took, so I thought he took the word very seriously. Let me say that. Mm-hmm. And we were fellowship and we found a place that suited our flesh. You know, big renowned Church of God in Christ assemb mm -hmm. fellowship church because it wasn't an assembly. Mm -hmm. um, and back then, and we got married in 93, but prep steps to being married, you had to get a blood test. Why? Don't know. But I knew wow. now it was the most high at work. And I didn't even know who he was back then. Didn't know his name. Didn't know nothing mm. about it. Just knew God and Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we got the blood test. His blood test came back. He had HIV. And it didn't really bother me. Because both of us were in the drug culture. Mm. So I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe he neglected to tell me he shot up or something like that. That's the way I was thinking. Mm -hmm. But understand this point. At this point, I was already dug in with this man. We had dated for like two and a half, three years before we had, he had even asked me to marry him. Wow. So we had some time in. I was already in love, so I thought. Right. But the long it, it, I guess it I might as well come out now. I found out later on even after he passed, after some things was revealed about him that I was more in love with the idea of being in love mm -hmm. than being in love with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to love nobody because I didn't receive it at home. The way my family, my mother showed me love was when I got in trouble was to buy me stuff. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until now after coming into the truth hearing my mother actually say, I love you. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about what she could give me, just the emotional support. At, at at let's say at 58 years old because I'm telling them myself <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. all those years wanting love searching for love in all the wrong places and all I wanted was true love that I now receive from the most high Yahweh but found out the man was HIV positive and we talked and he's like well I'm giving you your out essentially you we don't have to get married you know, I'm positive. You don't, we don't have to get married. But at, by that point, I, was, I already thought I was in love with him. I cared about him. And, I, and, and my example was, what if I found out you had cancer? Should I leave mm. him? Mm. It's just another disease. And in my heart of hearts, I did believe he could be healed. 
Mm-hmm. I, at that point, God can do anything but fail. So mm. I say for a year and a half for this exu- this just extraordinary wedding. It was mm. the wedding. It was the wedding of my dreams. It really was. Wow. <laughs> I put out. <laughs> wow. Okay. And we got mm-hmm. married and he found an apartment and he wouldn't let me come over to the apartment. He didn't want us to fall and do anything. So I thought. Found out some stuff later, but that's, you know, we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. So we got married. Um, I married him and my mother told me, matter of fact, not too long ago that my uncle, the second oldest son, asked her, is he gay? And mommy said, no. He said, you sure? But she didn't tell me this till maybe about, I want to say maybe five years ago. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? She said, because your head was so hard and you were just literally stiff necked. Nobody could tell you anything. And it's true. You Mm -hmm. couldn't. I remember going to meetings and and some of the other guys in in the meetings would be like, you going to marry him? And it didn't register. I didn't see that he may have been somebody who was on a down low because he didn't act like that around me. He didn't have no behaviors or or anything that I could that I could see. But I was blinded because I was in love with the idea of being in love. Mm-hmm. So we end up getting married. And I think it may have been. It may have been six months into our marriage. Something had happened where as though he came home really, really in the early hours of the morning, like two, three in the morning. I was sitting up. I was nervous. You know, is he in an accident? Is everything okay? Mm -hmm. Um, Did we have cell phones? We had cell phones. I'm calling him. He's not answering. So I'm thinking the worst at this point, thinking something that happened to my husband. He came home drunker than I have ever seen through our whole relationship. He never drank. He didn't snort. He didn't smoke. He didn't do nothing because, again, we were in Narcotics Anonymous. We didn't we, we chose to not lead that kind of life anymore. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, what in the world have you done? And he just kept crying and saying, baby, I'm sorry. Baby, I'm sorry baby, I'm sorry. And his bowels became loose. I put him in the shower, washed him up, brought him back into the bedroom and began to dry his body off. And I saw something. That a place that should be this big was like this big. So that Mm. very night I found out what his secret was. Mm. Wow. Wow. And I just cried. Mm-hmm. I didn't even understand by sleeping and us having intercourse and I was having a sodomite spirit transferred into me. Mm-hmm. And the next morning I said, we need to have a conversation. He never admitted, but he didn't have to at that point because the cover came on. And I said, I tell you what, he's like, what, you're going to leave me? We're going to get a divorce. I was like, no, because I don't believe in divorce. I still don't believe in divorce. Not for me. I said, I will earn it, our marriage vows. I will cook and clean. I will, I will do what I'm supposed to do with the exception of there will be no physical intimacy between me and you ever again. Hmm. Because even at that point, I began to notice that even before he had went out and did this, he became impotent. I didn't turn him on anymore. Hmm. And it hurt me because being the sexualized, perverted person I was, I equated love a lot of times with that physical act. So when I didn't get it from him, I'm like, well, 
I had started gaining weight, maybe I'm not beautiful to him anymore. You know, because I even do this, I found out, you know, later on that I was a very emotional eater. Mm-hmm. You know, I went from being a size 10 at our wedding to being close to a 16. Because food was tasting good. I wasn't smoking no more. I wasn't drinking no more. Food became very tasty. Mm -hmm. And to deal with my feelings, not the way I used to, I picked up a new thing, overeating. So Mm -hmm. I thought maybe that was it, you know. And I began to guilt and shame and blame myself for things that weren't happening in our marriage. Mm -hmm. But no. Long story short, I, he never admitted it. I had begun to pray, and I was like, look, if I find out you do this again, we're going to have another problem. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, it's going to be voluntarily or involuntarily, but you're going to be up out of here. You know, you can go back home to your mama if you want to. You know, and that was another story, but mm-hmm. found that out. Long story short, we stayed married. We stayed in the same bed, just didn't do the physical act. I still loved him. I still honored most of those marriage vows. You know, I wasn't mm-hmm. disrespectful. I didn't call him a bunch of names, even though in my heart I wanted to. In mm-hmm. my head, I did. You know, and I was like, I, I will not get divorced. I will not be part of that statistic. Not even understanding that and found out later after he passed by his first cousin who knew he was in that lifestyle even when he was in college. She said, I want you to know and I love you, but I want you to to know that he loved you even though you was his beard. And being a beard means you the covering that make the appearance that he's a heterosexual male to his family, to his mother especially. Wow. And that hurt me because I was like, why would you, why would y'all, nobody say nothing to me? Well, because you was hard headed. Nobody could tell you nothing. You knew what was best for you, so you thought. Hmm. We, we stayed married for almost two years. We got married in 93, May 8th, 1993, January 6th. 1995 he had passed from being in the hospital close to almost two months he got sick three days after my birthday and I literally carried him on my back to the hospital because he wouldn't Mm -hmm. let me drive the car (laughs) Mm -hmm. he wouldn't let me drive the car because I didn't have a license. I knew how to drive, but I didn't have a license yet. So he wouldn't let me drive the car. So I took him to the hospital. And long story short, they found 13 tumors in his brain. Mm. And he began to go have hallucinations and didn't begin to forget who I was. He remembered his parents, but he couldn't remember me. And I was like, okay, what in the world is going on? And I spoke to the doctor and he's like, do you know, um, what did they, CDC lymphoma, brain cancer. That was Mm. the way he transitioned out and Mm. went to see him that day on the 6th, early, like early in the 6th. And about the time I got home, his mother, his father was calling me because I was at my mom's house. And she called, he called me and said, I need you to get back to the hospital. And I'm like, what's going on? He said he just passed. So I rushed back to the hospital and I remember seeing him and I remember being so angry. What did you expose me to? Mm-hmm. What did you expose me to? And because we found out that he was full blown when he passed, mm. I then tested, got tested for 14 years to see, to make sure I was not infected. Mm. All praises mm. to the most high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I never tested possible. Wait a minute. Let me tell you. 
the mm-hmm. story does not end. Okay. Um, when 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 he passed, uh, I began to be in a relationship with a married man. Because for me, it was comfortable. I didn't have to worry about him wanting to really get, you know, really, really interested in me. Mm-hmm. He left his wife. We moved in together. Mm-hmm. And he began to talk about marrying me. And one day we were in, I was in his apartment got a phone call from his children's mother, who I didn't know he had children. Mm. And she began to tell me this is his M.O. because she was his first wife. He left his second wife for me. He about to make me the third wife. Mm. And I remember hearing a voice that told me, go find all the blow he had stashed. And I began to snort and thought I was about to have a heart attack that I put so much up my nose. Went to the emergency room. The first person that I saw in the emergency room was a nurse who I used to make meetings with. And he called me by my name, told about what you doing here. And I was like, just leave me alone. And while I was in the back, they literally put me in the room with a metal slab, not a hospital bed. And I was laying on this cold metal slab. And I heard within myself, surrender to me. Or die. Mm. And I'm like, what? And I sat up and I looked around. I was like, why am I in a room that looks like a morgue? I literally was on a metal table. Now, I messed with enough funeral directors to know what that room looked like. Mm. And I got up and I left out the hospital and I walked back to his apartment. And I began to pack all my things because I knew for me, it was the voice of God, but it was actually the voice of the most high. Yeah. I just didn't know his name. I didn't know who he was yet, but I know I heard someone speaking to me in a clear, distinctive voice and fear and trepidation. My heart was going like this. I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I walked to that apartment and I packed all my stuff and I went to my mother's house. And he came and he called. He's like, what's going on? Where's all your stuff? I said, I moved out. And he's like, well, why did you move out? Long story. I talked about the first wife that I didn't know about. The children I didn't know about. The second wife. And now you're going to make me. No. The father told me up and out. You out mm-hmm. of here. You cannot have a relationship with this man. Because first of all, he's somebody else's husband. Mm-hmm. I didn't call you to this. Mm. So I left him. I began to uh, fellowship with a woman pastor that I met when I was 15, but she wasn't pastoring me. She wasn't even, she was still, you know, still in the world back then. I remember hearing her saying, she don't like that little girl talking about me. And she actually Mm. turned out later, years later, to be the woman that I sat up under who was my pastor. Mm. The woman that I was ordained as an evangelist up under. Mm. And she would rightly divide the word of truth. And, 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 and being up under that, that fellowship, I learned a lot about myself. The Most High really began to deal with me back then. But something that transpired, I broke fellowship with her. And it wasn't nothing she did. It was me. It was those spirits in me. It was like, you got the... Because even then, because she, I began to live my life according to scripture. And my mother said, you're in a cult. 
because mm-hmm. it don't take all of that. Mm-hmm. Holiness don't take all of that, you know. And my flesh started acting up, and I wanted to be with this guy who seemed to be interested in me. So I left. And I began to have a relationship with this man, only to find out having unprotected relations, he was HIV positive and had hep C. So I not only jumped back into the frying pan, I was in the fire there. Because he had HIV and hep C. Two things that are incurable in the medical world. Right, mm-hmm. right. And I moved in with him and was still working and got a TB exposure. Yeah. Tell me y'all's judgment was not on me. Got TB, hit his man, got HIV. We've been having unprotected sex. Now I got a test for hep C2. Mm. And I began to test and they came back negative. And I told the most high right then, I ain't having unprotected sex no more. Not that I'm not going to fornicate. Mm. I'm not going to have unprotected sex no more. Everybody going to wear a hat. Mm. Didn't recognize, still didn't recognize I needed deliverance from spirits of perversion. Broke up with him and just began to, went back into smoking weed and I started taking this new pill that I never took before because I was going to the psychiatrist and they said, oh, you bipolar. And I began to take Xanax for the highs and lows. Still not understanding. I'm in true spiritual warfare. These things is coming after me. Why? Because of disobedience. Mm. Because here he's speaking to me. I ain't know that voice. That's just something. I always say, mm. even when, even when, even when um, I would hear the Holy Spirit, or uh, as you know in church word, the Holy Ghost, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was still outwardly define him. I was just like my ancestors in the wilderness, mm. not even knowing that I was them yet. Still didn't know mm. that yet. Right. So I began to take the Xanax and I began to abuse the Xanax. And I relocated from Philadelphia and moved all the way to the Midwest, to Oklahoma. And my life got flipped, turned upside down. It just, I was just off the rails. You know, I was still working, but the drug addiction had came back with a a divorce. You know, it it Mm. increased. That spirit that went out and came back and found the house swept and cleaned. Mm-hmm. seven other spirits back mm-hmm. with it. So some other stuff began to really kick off. Mm-hmm. You know, the perversion mm-hmm. kicked up. You know, the drug addiction kicked back up. The meanness and the placability really was on high alert. Relocated back to Philadelphia again. Um, moved back in with my mother um, to help because my sister had had a massive stroke at that point Mm. to help raise my niece and smoke from sunup to sundown. Mm. As soon as I woke up, I needed an L. I rolled me a blunt. All throughout the day, I'm smoking a blunt. To go to sleep, I'm smoking a blunt. And then, you know, I was just drinking wine and beer previously. No, it was the hard liquor, tequila, just shots with a beer chaser. Begin to black out and wake up in my own excrement. Mm-hmm. My mother said, you got a problem. You need to go to treatment. All through this, you know, and it's a part that I miss. Even when my sister had the stroke and there were three times they called us to say, get to the hospital. Her blood pressure is like 62 over 35. And even though I was still, I was worldly and 
I believed in the power of the Most High, even though I was calling him God. And I would go to the hospital and I literally would stretch out on her and pray. Please don't take her, Father. I need mm-hmm. her. She has to raise her daughter. I need, I need you to just do whatever you have to do, but don't take her from me. And it got overwhelming. And I'm taking the Xanax and I'm drinking and I'm smoking weed. And long story short, I had took so many Xanax and got in the tub and realized that I took over close to 30 pills. And um called the the I, I think it poison prevention line and they sent the ambulance and they put me in the hospital. I remember getting in the ambulance. I remember getting out of the ambulance to go into the emergency room. But then I remember getting out of the ambulance again and they had put me in the psychiatric hospital because they said I was trying to commit suicide. I wasn't trying to commit suicide. I was trying to go to sleep because I was so stressed with everything that was going on in my life that all I wanted to do was just go to sleep. Mm-hmm. It was too much. I was too overwhelmed. I was taking care of a niece. I've never had children. And my mother's depending on me. My sister, every other week, they saying she's going to die. I can't do this either. Yeah, I'm not trying to kill myself. I just need some rest. I felt mm-hmm. like I was going crazy. Mm-hmm. Until I got to Belmont. <laughs> And that first night they had a young lady in the room with me and she was, she had lesions because these things was audible in different voices. Hmm. And I literally sat up all night. I couldn't go to sleep. Hmm. And she, they, she the next morning said, I, ha- I can't be in the room with her. I can't be in the room with her. And I thought I was crazy and I thought I was hearing voices. I realized by being there, I truly was not as crazy as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I saw and experienced some things there that really started having me pray again. Even though it was to the false one, I began to, my prayer life increased. I was like, Father, you're going to have to get me up out of here. I'm gonna do it. I didn't want to do none of the stuff that I didn't want to take the medicine and you want me on this medicine. I just came in here because y'all said I tried to commit suicide with my Xanax and I listened to the people's stories and I said, seven days. You said I'm in here for seven days. I'm gonna do this seven days so I can get my freedom. Because you know, when they 302 you, when they put you in the mental hospital, they can keep you as long as they want if you are not compliant. So my best bet was to be as compliant as they wanted me to be so I could get out. Came out, still was, you know, not, 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 not reading scripture, but I did begin to pray. And I literally went to a, ch- I went to a church that my former pastor had told me, don't go to that church. That's all she said. I'm like, why? She said, whatever you do, if I die today or tomorrow, don't go to that church. And I was at that point, I'm like, I need to get back into church. I need to start reading the word. I need to fellowship with God. I need to hear his voice. And I was led to the very church she told me not to go to. And I stayed there for five years. Because in an act of disobedience, cover came off. This church was, they had more people in the life, undelivered, in there just dating and physically fighting in the church. Never heard anything from the pulpit about Uh, men with men working that thing which is unseemly receiving in themselves recompense which was me never heard none of that Mm. never heard anything women becoming brute beasts 
leaving the natural you never mm -hmm. heard because the congregation 75 percent of the congregation was that way and if Thank they God. weren't that way there was a whoremonger spirit in there what? and i sat there and i was like please get me out of here god please father get me out of here i need to leave in I was not, the spirit would not let me leave because covers was coming off. Not about them, but about me. Mm. And he began to deal with me and show me and deliver me. And I began to repent and I began to cry out. And when he finally released me from that place, I went to another church with a bishop who used to call the first pastor I was up under, his spiritual mother. So we had fellowship even when I was under that 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 fellowship. Mm -hmm. And even being in there, the Most High began to show me and deliver me and show me and show me. And I'm like, why am I here? I'm just his Holy Ghost uh, cheerleader. That's what he called me. Mm. Even though I was allowed to to teach, but correction would come because I was still implacable. I was still cold. And he told me I talked about me too much. I inserted I too much when, you know. And I remember asking him, I said, who else am I going to preach about? When he gives me scriptures He's dealing with me. I am the first partaker. So maybe I'm not saying it correctly, but he was dealing with me in all that. I finally heard the voice again. That same one I heard, serve me or die in the hospital. Where I heard it again. And I heard him say, come out from among them. Hmm. And I remember not really understanding. And I called the bishop the bishop it was a first name basis with him I say I'm done I'm tired of this church foolishness I'm done no well you don't have to leave the faith you don't and he I literally let this man talk me into still fellowshipping but maybe a year afterwards the pandemic happened mm. And that's when the Most High said, don't go back. I heard him, don't go back. Because I was seeing some things there that wasn't lining up to what the word was saying. Because I started reading again. I started studying again. I started mm -hmm. hearing the voice. The voice. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So maybe two more, three more years, I'm home. And, and this bishop still calls me to this day. The last time he called me, he last time he called me, because I never really just said, I'm not coming back to you. Okay. I said within myself, most high, I'm obedient to you. I still was calling him God because I wasn't in the truth yet. I just said, you know, why do, do I owe him an explanation? No. <laughs> I don't have, he don't have heaven or hell to put me in. Mm -hmm. He's just a man. He's flesh and blood like me. He's the mm -hmm. genius of man. He's mankind. Mm -hmm. I don't need to write no letter or none of that foolishness. I'm mm -hmm. not getting into the dogma of churchiality. I'm not doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I just began to sit home, sit home and read. I wasn't even, I came away from watching even churches on YouTube. And at some point, 2023, we up now up to 2023, I began, I was led to watch, or it came on my timeline, Truth Unedited. And I began to watch him. Now, by this point, I'm still smoking. I'm still mm -hmm. drinking liquor. I'm still smoking weed from the time I get up to the time I get down. Mm -hmm. But something within me was saying, watch him. Mm -hmm. And I began to watch him. And I think maybe close to a month later, the way TV came up on my feet. 
And I began to watch you and Brother Rasha. Mm -hmm. And I began to weep. Mm -hmm. And I began to call on the name of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Yahweh. And I said, if this is you, mm -hmm. and you are talking to me, I need you to help me in this area. Deliver me from these spirits of addiction. Mm -hmm. If you're real. Mm -hmm. And I heard the Ruach HaKadosh very clearly say this. This kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. I said, Father, is this yeah. you? Tell me how long. And I heard seven days. Mm -hmm. And I turned my plate down. And mm -hmm. I turned my television off. And I turned the radio off because these other things were distractions. And I opened my Bible. Mm -hmm. And I said, show me. And he began to pour it. Mm -hmm. And on that mm -hmm. seventh day, I was set free. The cravings oh, were gone. The, it, but this, I still would smell the smell even in my room. And mm -hmm. I literally got up on that seventh day and I totally GI'd my room. Mm -hmm. I threw out all lighters. I threw out all the cigars, the blunt paper, the top mm -hmm. paper, the easy water, the, 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 the tequila that I still had, I poured out. I Opened all the beer cans and poured them out. I said, Father, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, Uh oh, mm -hmm. what happened? That's okay. That's okay. I don't know. I don't know. Something with uh, the. It timed out. There it is. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I said, I mm -hmm. need you to lead me and guide me mm -hmm. by your, your Holy Spirit because I, I didn't even know any. um Arbory at that time. I don't, still don't know that much, but I know a few words, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, mm -hmm. I believe you. I'm trusting mm -hmm. everything that's within me for, for you to work a work in me. Mm -hmm. And I began to faithfully yeah. begin to watch you and Brother Rasha. Because you see, I, I, I sent you a message when I, the very first time, no, I sent you a message after I had ordered from I Know My Father because I got the Fear Yahuwah sweatshirt. And I okay. messaged you. We began Wait, to um, sis, repeat that again. I don't know what happened. It had kicked you out. But when you said you messaged me, I start had, there. I had messaged you right after I had bought my Fear Yahuwah sweatshirt. Right. You didn't message me back. Wait. My okay. flesh, I heard my flesh and was able to discern it was my flesh, not just something, not the walk out of it, but I heard my flesh say, see, they don't even love you. Oh. And I began to rebuke it in the name of Yahweh Shah HaMashiach. I mm. said, wait a minute, they got a large flesh. How many hundreds of people? Mm -hmm message them because I still wasn't in fellowship. I didn't have fellowship yet. Right. I didn't know anybody in the truth yet. So I was right. still feeling very lonely and by myself. Yeah. And I know it was the most high talking to me and ministering to me because I said they got hundreds of people on the platform. Mm. I need to trust in you, y'all. And mm. it's okay if they don't never reach back out to me. Mm. When thy mother and thy father forsake thee, mm -hmm. then Yahuwah will take you up. And he began mm -hmm. to speak his word to me mm -hmm. in the personage of his Ruach HaKadah. He began to minister to me through spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. And I didn't oh, yeah. see generally, hallelujah, I would get mad at the person or I would mm -hmm. get mad at me. But there was shalom. There was peace. Hallelujah. And I said, Abba, yeah, you're going to do this thing, ain't you? 
I remember saying, <laughs> you go do this thing. Um, and I still continue to watch. I continue to watch Truth Unedited. And I begin mm -hmm. to increase in watching you guys. Because mm -hmm. I went back in history and saw videos that were put out way before I even knew about his name. Before mm -hmm. I even knew about Yahweh. Well, yeah, well, right. I just mm -hmm. begin to watch. I begin to feed on the word, mm -hmm. not just through your videos. And then I, I, I bought a sefer, and I mm -hmm. started reading and going line by line, and precept upon precept. I began to read the lost books, mm -hmm. the books I was told don't you ever read. <laughs> right. They were taken out for a reason. Yeah, I know what the reason is to keep us hidden in darkness and not mm -hmm. to know the truth about who we are in your home. Yes, indeed. Because I even even when I was watching, go back a little bit, when I was watching um, Truth Unedited and he said something, I was like, cursed? What do you mean I'm cursed? <laughs> you crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the video, it, it talked about Deuteronomy 28. I said, oh, I read that. That don't mean nothing. No, <laughs> I might have read it, but I didn't understand it. And the Ruach Hakkad just said, reread it. And I began to read it. And I began to understand who I am, who mm -hmm. my ancestors was. They just wasn't slaves. They were the chosen children of the Most High. And because of our, and I say our, because we still disobedient in some areas of our lives. You know, at, at, even the people mm -hmm. that I saw that they were uh, Hebrew Israelites with the purple and the gold on in Philadelphia in the corners. I was like, how will anybody want to come to the, y'all understanding the way y'all talk to them people? <laughs> kiss my shoes, kiss my feet. And I said, I will never be part of a camp. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> so why my mama tell me while I was home that oh you sound no you t you brother Rasha and you and me are now Hebrew Israelites we're in the cult cool, cool. I said well mm. hallelujah mm. I'd rather be in the cult and being obedient to him and his word I know that's and right doing what he tell me to do and reading and say what he had me to say and being quiet when he tell me to be quiet. But you if that's what a cult is, then hey, so be it. I'm in a cult. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, Hallelujah. indeed. So, mm, mm, mm. so after the fast and after he began to deliver me, my mom was still smoking weed mm. and drinking. And I would get so vexed from the smell. And I said, she's going to have to stop this foolishness. And I heard the Royal Cockage and said, turn your plate down for her. Turn your plate down. I delivered you. Can I not deliver her? Turn mm. your plate down. So I began to pray and fast. And every time she would come downstairs in my room, it was your videos or truth unedited or some teaching concerning um, the Hebrew Israelites and using our bari. You know, and she would come down. She'd be like, ah, you're in the cold. And I'd just say, say nothing. I'm not fussing. And went upstairs one day. And my niece and I, we were in there. My mother had been smoking. And I said, Mosa, I know you're going to deliver her. And when she came back in the room, she sat, she went into the kitchen. And she had this look. And she literally slid down the wall and began to seize. And while she was seizing, I flipped her to be on her side, but she began to vomit. And I began to pray. Mm -hmm. In my secret language, in my closet, I began to pray. And I began to thank the Most High Yah for delivering, save her and deliver her, Father. Save her and deliver. I just kept saying, save her and deliver. And when she came to herself and she sat up and I cleaned her up and she looked at me, she said, and use the word. That stuff was good. I said, Mommy, don't smoke no more. She said, I'm not smoking no more. And since that day, she has been set free. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She ain't came into the truth yet. And I say yet. Because mm -hmm. as the Most High has me speak to her. And while I'm speaking, I'm praying. And generally, when I hear him say, call your mother. 
fast. Call your mother fast because he's been increasing fastings with me since the beginning, since January. Mm -hmm. That Greco Roman calendar, not our calendar. <laughs> you know, he was, he, every time I turn around, I hear fast. I ain't never fasted so much in my life. Mm -hmm. Never wanted to fast because I knew it did something to me. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, that uh, mm -hmm. apocalypse of Elijah? Mm -hmm. I think I heard mm -hmm. that on y'all channel too about mm -hmm. them fat, a pure fast. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, Yahweh. <laughs> Thank you, Yahuwah. He, mm -hmm. I, you, yeah, and I, this is why I say all the time, and I know other people say it too, but Yah is truly amazing. He is. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yes. And I want to say something too to you that yes, I'm sorry if um, you said you had sent a message and um, I didn't respond. And let me tell you, like, if, if I don't respond to messages, it's because I did not see the message. A lot of times we get a flood and some messages be so long and some messages just be hidden in between. I'm just being honest. So we try to like keep up with everything, you know. I, I, so, that's why that's uh, why the most high did not allow me to get in my flesh about it. Right. They said right. they get hundreds. Oh yeah, we get a lot hundreds. of emails. And he said, but yeah. you you know and the more and even in that be being able to have Amona and faith and trust the yes, most high yeah because right that was what I needed. Even in yes. the, you know, the, the yes. scripture said that all things work together for good, not mm -hmm. the good. Because I hear people put that the in there. No, all right. things work together for good. Mm -hmm. yes. To them that yell y'all and order called according to his purpose. I was called right. to this. I was yes. chosen to this. So I had to learn mm -hmm. how to trust and depend on him, even when nobody else was around me. Yes. So that even, is the truth. After That's why that, we always talk about that that relationship. Yes, how important it is, you know. Yes, yes. Everybody. Mm -hmm. So, story not over yet. Okay. <laughs> so all that okay. and, and all that, and now coming to the understanding that who my father is, and knowing his name, and knowing my kinsman redeemer's true name, not that false pagan name, I begin to ask the Most High. I desired fellowship. I was so used to going in church and being with people that it was it was unusual for me not to be or fellowship with another human being right next to me. Right. So I was in contact with somebody else I used to church with and she f was fellowshipping with this place that I thought it said Yahuwah. It said Yahweh. Okay. And I went there and I think I was there. I went there four times for a whole month. And a couple of things had transpired where I was like, these people are not talking and walking the same mm -hmm. way I am. Because some mm -hmm. things had even transpired with me and her relationship. And when in the most high, I was like, look, I'm going to lead you. Let me lead you. So I broke off fellowship with them because they were called. I remember. And the apostle, he looked at me when I said it. He said, he was saying, praise Yahweh. And I was like, Yahuwah. <laughs> and he looked at me. He said, what did you say? I said, Yahuwah. <laughs> Him name not Yahweh. <laughs> yes, it is. And I said, I'm not going to argue with you, sir. I'm not. <laughs> You know, long story short, I was no longer fellowshipping with them. I was okay. no longer fellowshipping with the friend um, because cover kept coming. You know, he pulls, he reveals, even though when he reveals things in other people, you need to, he reveals it about you too. And I was like, okay, we still need to seek deliverance for this thing, th these traces of this coldness, mm. these traces of this hardness. Mm. You sounded like a Pharisee. <laughs> <laughs> and I began to laugh. I said, Oh, I'm sounding like my sister Abia, how she used to be. Mm -hmm. I was about to it. say that, so you mm -hmm. said it for me. That you used to be, you know. So mm -hmm. I said, Okay, Abba, you know, I need you, I need you to help me. I, I desire fellowship and I desire to, you know, be around people who are of like Ruach. 
and I was we were wa- I was watching you, you watching you and your husband, and a sister came up in the chat, and she made a comment, and I made a comment to her comment, mm-hmm. and she made a comment back to my comment. Long story short, we you know we was going at each other in the comments and not in a bad way. It was right. it was iron sharpening iron. So it y- y'all had came on and went off, and I'm sitting there and I was like, oh, Father, is there a way for me to meet this young lady? And I heard him say Facebook, which is something I generally I have a Facebook page, but I don't go on there that much unless you know. I'm led to. Right. And I was looking at the Facebook page and I started typing her name, but it didn't come up. And I heard the father say, type in this name. And I typed in that name. And it was her. And I sent her a friend request. And at the same time, she got the friend request. And she's like, I don't know who that is. And she said, the father told her that Stacy. That's my government name. Mm-hmm. And she accepted my friend request. And when and immediately when she accepted the friend request, you know that little telephone will pop up or the messenger pop up. And I looked and I said, Father, should I call her? Should I call her? And he said, what's the script? If you want a friend, make yourself friendly, something like that. And mm-hmm. I called and she answered. And we talked, and we've been talking ever since. Long story short, she now calls me Ama. <laughs> she is my spiritual daughter. Aww. She's the one that said, give them your testimony. And you know who this person is. <laughs> Malaka. Malaka <laughs> and my brother, Zane Koff. And my new sister, um who does the poetry. I just watched her, her testimony. Tequila? Tequila Praise. Mm. And we all fellowship under, um, we go on Hallelujah Hour with Pastor Rick Fletcher. All right. So the very desire of my heart, praying for fellowship mm-hmm. and family, he's given mm. to me. Hallelujah. So I give, all praise and esteem to the most high. Yeah, this thing has just. <laughs> Beautiful to hear. It's done so Beautiful much for me. I'm no longer alone. Not that I was alone anyway. Right. You know, right. but I have, I have personal contact. Yeah. And, and I needed that. So I recently, not recently, it's been two months now. I relocated from New York, um, from, from Philadelphia okay. to New York. Mm-hmm. And I am Malaka's caregiver. Oh, so <laughs> now I have daughters, beautiful, and sons, but I got grandchildren because mm-hmm. her children call me Ama. They be like grandma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the so very beautiful. thing I used to cry about not having babies because I never, I never was able to have children. Mm. So he's given me the desires of my heart, but just in a more excellent. Mm. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All praises. All praises. Yes. To oh, how beautiful. Hallelujah. Wow. Yes. That is so good to hear. That is so good to hear. Um, I really don't. I w- I'm just trying to think of it because you said a lot. You said a lot, <laughs> which is some good stuff, you know. Um, and sharing the testimony is always good because you never know who's listening. Right. And um, our testimonies could definitely help others. This is why we often talk about, you know, the importance of sharing our testimonies. You never know who would hear it and who it could lead to, y'all. Right. That's what we're called to do, you know. Uh I hate it. My phone just rang. I thought I turned it off. Does that? That's okay. That's okay. But like I was saying, that's what we're called to do as believers. You know, be seed planners. This is this this right here. It's what you're doing. So um it's beautiful. Your testimony is beautiful. Um just just hearing it like how y'all brought you through all of that to where you are today. 
Yeah. It's so amazing. And I, I I just thank you that you chose to share that here, yes. you know, yeah. on um, well, I, our... I, 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 I trust in the Ruach that's in you and Brother Rasha. I, mm. I trust y'all. Yeah. You know, I trust Hallelujah. the words that are coming out of your mouth because, you, you know, and it's always backed up with scripture. You could tell a person mm-hmm. anything, but tell me the word. Feed me right. food that's sufficient for me. Feed me. Right. I need the word. So, you know, and I mm-hmm. and I love the way the most high uses the two of you together, you know. Oh. And I Hallelujah. said if and I said, if most high, if you ever allow me to get married again, that's what I desire. Mm-hmm. I desire a husband that's spirit filled and spirit led. But mm-hmm. I am almost at the age where mm-hmm. um as the scripture says, I am, I'm about to be a widow indeed. Mm. I'll be, yeah, I'm willing, I'll be 59 this year. Next right. year, you know, a widow indeed is 60, a husband, a wife to one husband. You know, I don't have no babies of my flesh, mm-hmm. but I got enough of them in the Ruark now. So yeah. I, whatever he has for me is for me. But if he tells me that's to be, that, 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 that the, the maker, the creator is my maker, is my husband, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. fine with that too. Right. That's that's how it has to be. Like where we can just be content in yeah, if that's where we need to be, you know. Because I can focus all my attention on him and not mm-hmm. not on the husband. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much um for sharing with us this. Um it was a beautiful testimony. And um we are just so grateful to have heard it, you know. And uh I'm just trying to think just want to make sure that we test on everything. Um, I usually ask at the end, like any advice, is there any advice you would like to uh, share? I guess with, um, I would say just any advice period when it comes to those who may be here. And if, if anybody's, um, like, how can I say that? Maybe straddling in the fence or something, or just dealing with, um, you know, with dealing with themselves, dealing with overcoming something. The, oh, my only suggestion is to pray and listen. Have the most high hone your ears in the spirit to hear his voice. Mm-hmm. Because if you ask him a question in all sincerity, he'll answer you. Mm-hmm. May not be immediate. <laughs> But he'll answer. And the thing about even if it's not immediate, that we have to trust and believe and wait. Let patience have her perfect work. You know, we have to wait. I always wanted immediate answers. But this experience has taught me to wait on Mm y'all. And not lean to the left or lean to the right or lean to my own understanding, but to wait on the most high y'all. Because mm-hmm. if it's his will that that thing would come to fruition in your life, it's going to come to fruition in your life. But we just have to be patient. We have to wait on him. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.